Hello, and welcome to water safety training. Before we get started, please remember that it's one test per person. Following the conclusion of this training, you'll turn that test into your Pathways Family Specialist. They'll score the test, upload it to your file, where you will receive one hour of training credit. Uh, water safety is a training that we do usually the second quarter of every year as we're coming into the summer months and getting a little bit warmer, and we want to keep that water safety on the forefront of everyone's mind. As we follow along in our test, I'll try to give you uh, where those test questions lie uh, to kind of help you throughout the, the PowerPoint process. So with some water safety tips, it's important that we know where our children are at all times. Uh, you would think that's common sense, but uh, when we're on vacation and the children are out near a lake, a pool, uh, at the hotel, uh, it's very uh, important that we do remember where our children are at all times. Use an approved barrier to separate the pool from the house. If you do have a swimming pool, uh, there is a series of things that you have to follow in order for the, uh, the compliance of state licensing regulations. We're gonna cover those in a couple of slides from now. Uh, again, as we're coming into the summer months, this is where we see a lot of families uh, put their homes up for sale and start looking at buying a new home or installing a swimming pool. So this will be a good information session for you. Uh, it's important to have a, a telephone near the pool because it allows you to call 911 in the event of an emergency. So that might be number one on your test if you're following along. Never allow children to be alone near a pool or any source of water. It's very important that we keep those children in sight supervised at all times. Have life-saving devices near the pool, such as a pole, hook, or flotation device. Number six on your test. We kind of jump around just a little bit. Keep large objects such as ta uh, tables, chairs, toys, and ladders away from the pool, especially our above ground pools where a child could slide uh, a pool, uh, a pool, a table or a chair near the pool and climb over once we've removed that ladder. So we just wanna make sure that we're keeping those children safe. And that, uh, that too, like I said, that may be number 10 on your test. Uh, Keep uh, post 911 numbers near the phone. Very seldom do we have landlines anymore. A lot of times we have cell phones. Uh, in the event that we need a child to call 911, it's important that you do show them how to unlock your phone. Uh, so many times we do have our phone's password protected. So there is a way they can swipe on several different types of phone devices uh, and contact that 911 emergency number. So we wanna teach them how to do that in case there was an emergency where we needed their help and calling for that assistance. If you leave the pool or water area, be sure to take the child with you. Uh, even if we're just stepping inside the house for a moment, we have to keep those children in sight supervised at all times. Always have a designated child washer. If you're taking children uh, to a, a public pool or swimming pool area, a body of water, a lake, uh, ocean, a river, uh, we wanna make sure that there are other adults present so that you can have that designated child watcher that helps you with watching those, supervising those children. Uh, if you don't know how to uh, swim already, I think it would be pretty important, maybe now is the time to learn. Uh, take those swimming lessons during the summertime with the kids. Uh, and kind of make it a fun family-centered activity. Never swim alone or while under the influence of alcohol or medication. We also want to remember to never swim when there's thunder or lightning present. Remember uh, during your childhood, or maybe if you have children and you've gone to those water parks like Splashtown, and uh, I just try to think of a, a Fiesta Texas I know has one, as well as a Six Flags up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, but when there's thunder and lightning, they usually make everyone come in from the, the swimming pool area until that has passed. And so the same, you want to do that for the same if you do have a pool at home or you're vacationing somewhere, follow those same guidelines. Never dive into unfamiliar or shallow bodies of water. Uh, we may not know the depth of the water, and so we want to make sure that we are uh, being safe when it comes to that. Even where we can see clear to the bottom, again, we may not know what the depth is, even though we can see. So you want to be uh, familiar with uh, those bodies of water before you jump into them. So uh, do not run or horseplay around the swimming pool area. Uh, this could be number, number, not number seven. Um, well, 
I'm taking up some time trying to find that one. Uh, it is one of your, your test questions. Number eight, number eight on your test. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, again, that's when a child can fall, hit their head, fall into the swimming pool, drowning could take place, uh, traumatic brain injury. So we just wanna make sure that that uh, area around the pool is very slippery. And so we wouldn't want them falling in or hurting themselves during that time. Of, of course, playing. Uh, we want to make sure they always obey the posted rules. Even if you're at home, you need to have your household rules that you review with the children. Uh, if you do have a home pool, this is an excellent uh, restriction of privileges. If they cannot follow the rules, uh, they lost five minutes of swimming pool time or 10 minutes of swimming pool time. Uh, that would be a good uh, consequence uh, for not only not following those swimming pool rules, but maybe uh, if you have that direct access to a pool, uh, using that as a consequence. Now, if you're on vacation, you know, and there's there's kids swimming and all, we're not going to say you miss a whole day of swimming or, or the whole time we're here. So you want to keep that in smaller increments, like you have five minutes uh, that you have to sit out while the other children play uh, because you couldn't follow the rules. Uh, remove toys from the pool after everyone is done playing with them. Uh, we don't want to entice the children into jumping back into the pool. So we want to take those out, put them in an area, uh, you know, under the, um, under the patio or, or somewhere where you store them so the kids aren't enticed to jump back in with them. Never dunk or push people into pools because when we do, our natural reaction, that startle reaction is to inhale air. And when we do, that's where we could gasp and, and take in uh, water as we're breathing and fill the lungs. Uh, and if you're in the pool, that's when a child could become in distress. Uh, and, and a few slides from now, again, we're going to talk about dry drowning and those, those situations. Pool chemicals and pumps must be inaccessible to children. If you live in an apartment complex, or again, if you're on vacation at a hotel or somewhere, those pool pumps are usually inaccessible. But if you're in a home environment, we wanna make sure those that uh, pool and chemical, that pump and chemicals are inaccessible to children. So chemicals need to be locked or stored out of the reach of children so that they do not have access to them. Arm floaties are considered toys and they're not a substitute for parental supervision. So you wanna make sure that you are supervising children at all times. Uh, that's number 14 on your test, which would be false uh, because arm floaties are considered toys and we would not use them um, for, uh, um, uh, for life-saving devices. We would want to rely on a pole, branch, paddle, a hook, something we could reach out and grab that child with. Even drain pools can collect rainwater uh, and water from lawn sprinklers. It only takes a few inches of water for a child to drown. In most areas, it's against code to allow a pool to be left drained without proper fencing and barriers. Uh, so most drownings, this is one of your test questions, do occur at the child's own home. Uh, also, boys do drown more often than girls, but it's no reason to be just as careful with our supervision of all children. Any pool or body of water can be the site of a drowning and all children are at risk, even those children who know how to swim. Sometimes that gives them that little false sense of security there. So again, we just wanna make sure that we are uh, supervising them at all times. So here's where we talk about pool uh, gates and barriers. If you are buying a home that has a swimming pool or you're thinking about uh, putting a pool in for the summer, whether that's an above ground pool or an in ground pool, uh, here is some of those, those rules that we have to follow. Uh, children have the ability to climb and crawl and find their way into backyards and pool areas. All pool owners should secure their pool area and, and check the Department of State Health Services, any of their applicable state or local res, uh, regulations. Fences and walls must be at least four foot high and non-climbable. A good reference point is if you've ever lived in an apartment complex or you currently live in an apartment complex, uh, in all of those uh, situations, they have a fence around the pool that is usually four foot tall or higher. And when they say non-climbable, it's usually a fence that have the slats that run vertical. And so it's harder to get your foot in and climb over. And so that's usually kind of what they mean by a non-climbable fence where chain link fence is a little bit easier to get the toe of our shoe in and, and climb over that. Gates must be locked when the pool is not in use. Uh, 
Uh, a lot of our families that do have swimming pools put a padlock on the side gate so that that, that, that gate is inaccessible to children at all times. Uh, if you had a lawn mowing company or you yourself need to mow the lawn, I would recommend a padlock with accommodation code so that you're not searching for a key. It's one that you can remember and easily take that off when you're outside and it kind of doesn't restrict going in and out um, uh, of the yard or anything. Uh, keys to open the gate must be inaccessible to children if you do have a, a key to the gate or lock. Uh, latches should be at least four and a half feet above the ground. Fence openings should be four inches or less. Doors leading directly to the pool area should be self-closing and must have a lock that only adults or children over the age can reach. Now, it's not a licensing standard that, pool, that doors leading to the swimming pool area self-close. Uh, but it is a licensing standard that we have to have latches that a child 10 and younger would not be able to reach. Now that could be a chain latch or a hook and eye latch. It could be the kind that shoots straight up into the door frame, but something that a child 10 and younger would not be able to reach. Uh, and then windows should also be inaccessible to children. Uh, if you do have windows, uh, you know, a lot of us do have uh, alarm uh, on our, our, our homes so that if you did that child was to open a window you hear the beep 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 to let them know that a door or a window has been opened. Uh, the family has a physical barrier that is designated to limit access to swimming pool. The barriers include fences or walls or pool safety covers. Uh, so if you do have a, a backyard fence that does constitute a barrier around the pool. So that does, uh, there's your barrier there. So you would not have to have another separate barrier around the pool. Now, let's say you live out in the country on five or more acres and uh, you don't have a backyard fence. In that situation, you could use a pool cover uh, that goes over the swimming pool. There's lots of good websites out there. I know a frequent one that some of our families have used is called Catch a Kid, uh, spelt with K's instead of a C. And they do have uh, pool covers that hold up to 300 pounds. You can walk across the pool cover to the other side of the pool. So that would uh, constitute a barrier uh, in the situation where there was not a fence around uh, the pool. Uh, if it also includes the play area, the family understands that the child must not be allowed to play outside without adult supervision. So if you do have a trampoline, a swing set, and those types of things outside, and the child wants to go outside and play, that child does have to be inside supervised by an adult, not standing in the kitchen, washing dishes, watching them outside the window. We need to be outside with them and supervising them where you can respond quickly if that child was to follow the pool or something was to happen. Uh, the family needs two life-saving devices near the pool. Uh, for an example, that could be a, a reach pole, a throw bag with a brightly co colored rope, a flotation device, a buoy or a backboard. One additional life-saving device must be available for each 2,000 square feet of water surface. Uh, so if you have a, a, a pool that is 2,000 square feet of water surface or less, you only need two life-saving devices. As uh, it gets larger, if your uh, swimming pool is over 2,000 square feet, then you have to have an additional life-saving device per 2,000 square feet of uh, water surface. So uh, pool chemicals are stored away from the pool and not accessible to children. Kind of talked about that. And then supervision ratios. If you're going to take the children swimming and you're uh, going as a single adult and, and taking the kids, uh, here's some of those ratios for you. It's uh, for our, our babies, our zero to 23 month old children, it's one adult per child. If you're taking a child that's two years old, it's one adult per two children. And that goes up to our kids five and older, where it goes to one adult for six children. Now, if you wanted to be responsible for six children, uh, you know, I don't think I would want to take that responsibility. I, that's definitely where I'd want that designated child watcher, a friend to go with you and help watch the kids uh, while they're swimming and, and playing at the splash pads and, and those types of places that have those, those swimming pool areas or bodies of water. Getting help. This is number four on your test. Getting help 
on the way and removing the child from the pool is the most important thing to do when you find a child in trouble in the pool. Call 911 immediately and begin CPR. It says if you're trained as a foster parent and your babysitters, there's a reason that why licensing standards require CPR first aid, and it's for these types of situations. So this is where we would want to start using that training that you have received. If you're unsure about jumping in after someone, the best thing to reach them with is a pole, sturdy branch, or paddle. If you can't reach them, throw a floatable object to them. Uh, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was some uh, news segments on Dateline and, and 2020 where there were people being electrocuted while swimming. And so if you do feel that a, a person is uh, not necessarily drowning because they can't swim, but there's an electrical current, this is where you would want to reach them with that, that pole. Uh, you would want to make sure it's a wooden pole or something that's not a conduit for electricity. So uh, you might kind of want to take that into consideration if you do have a swimming pool and buying those life-saving devices or things that are maybe made out of wood and, and non-electrical um, current conducting. Fight drowning. Uh, when a child or adult falls into the water, it's human nature to inhale or gulp down water in a state of panic. Once the person has been rescued from the water, most of us would assume that the danger is over. Dry drowning or secondary drowning are both the results of injury that happen underwater. Dry drowning sets in less than an hour after inhaling water, but secondary drowning, which is pretty rare, um, can happen up to 48 hours after a water incident. Secondary drowning is caused by water that accumulates in the lungs. You should notice the warning signs of dry drowning within an hour uh, of getting out of the swimming pool or the water. Uh, dry drowning causes the vocal cords to close over the windpipe. This effect is called a laryngospasm. The laryngospasm could be mild, cause breathing to become difficult, or it can also be severe, preventing oxygen from getting uh, in or out of the lungs. So whenever we do inhale that water, uh, the way our body responds to that is by constricting uh, the, the vocal cords so that the, no more water is coming in. But what it also is doing is preventing the water from coming out. Uh, so some symptoms that we need to watch for is difficulty with breathing or speaking, irritability or unusual behavior, coughing, chest pains, uh, low energy or sleepiness after a water incident. Now we know after we all swim, especially for a few hours, we've been in the water all day, as well as kids, when we come in, we're tired, we're exhausted, we're ready to eat a large pizza and take a nap. Uh, so that might be more common for kids to do. We just wanna make sure that you are supervising them uh, for any of those types of symptoms. If your child is having difficulty breathing, they may be unable to speak or express their symptoms. That's why it's important to monitor your child carefully after a water scare to make sure they're breathing freely. If you see symptoms of dry drowning, you need to call the emergency medical assistance or dial 911 without delay. In the meantime, try to keep yourself or your child calm for the duration of the laryngospasm. Keeping calm can help the windpipe muscles to relax more quickly. Uh, once emergency help, help arrives, they may administer uh, treatment on the scene that may involve resuscitation if someone is passed out due to lack of oxygen. A lot of times they're just gonna give them oxygen so that it's, uh, they're getting the appropriate amount of oxygen that they need. Wing safety. Uh, check your boat for all required safety equipment. Uh, before we get on, we want to make sure how many passengers that boat can hold. Uh, does it have the appropriate number of life vests? Uh, does it have a fire extinguisher if there was a fire on the boat? So that we make sure that we have all that safety equipment. Don't overload the boats where it can have uh, run a risk of, of toppling over. If your boat does turn over, and this is number 11 on your test, uh, you should stay with it and wait for help. Don't try to swim to shore or anything like that. Wear your life jacket at all times. It's number 12 on your test. Uh, even if uh, you're an adult and you think you're an accomplished swimmer, if uh, the boat was to flip over or something to happen and you were to hit your head, uh, it doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are if you're unconscious. So we want to make sure that everybody has that life jacket on. Have a float plan with a member of your family or friend. Uh, kind of like when we're little kids and we'll go on field trips and everybody would hold hands. Uh, we want to make sure that all the kids are accounted for. So let's say there's five children and there's two adults 
know which three children that you're going to be responsible for and which two children the other person's going to be responsible for. If a boat was to turn over and we were grabbing children, we know quickly which ones we need to be grabbing rather than trying to count in our head and trying to figure out which one that we're missing. So we grab those three that we're responsible for, then we can start helping the other adult or adults uh, in, in finding the children that they were responsible for. Never swim alone and only swim in designated areas. When we're in open uh, bodies of water, uh, a lot of times we go to lake, ponds, and rivers because they're often popular water sites for swimming and water recreation. Unfortunately, the water's often murky and a little more difficult to see through, uh, which may make it a little more hazardous than, than the swimming pool. Uh, even when a lifeguard is present, you must be careful in and around open bodies of water uh, because that lifeguard may not be able to see through the water. And if a child goes under and they were looking another direction, then they look back, they're not gonna know that there was a child in that area. Uh, consider the following important factors when selecting a safe air area for swimming in these open water uh, areas. Select a supervised area, uh, one that may have a lifeguard or there are other adults present that can help with that uh, supervision. Select an area that is clean and well-maintained. Select an area that has good water quality and safe natural conditions. Make sure the water is deep enough before entering head first. We don't want to jump in head first and hurt ourselves or our child to hurt themselves. Be sure that rafts and docks are in good condition before we all go out on them. Avoid drainage ditches and arroyos because those can have fast moving, moving water. And with fast moving water also carries other things like water moccasins, uh, floating ant beds, you know, those different types of things that could also be harmful to us. River currents, this is number 15 on your test. River currents are often unpredictable and fast moving. They may change directions abruptly because of the bottom changes. You might see the current on the surface, even though uh, you might not see the, the current on the surface, even though the surface below is moving much stronger. If you are being carried by a river current, roll over onto your back and go downstream feet first. When you're out of the strongest part of the current, swim straight towards the shore. The current will carry you downstream as you swim towards the shore. Stay out of rivers and creeks after heavy rains because of the dangers in uh, rising waters and floods. So we want to make sure that everybody's staying safe at all times. Now that's a relatively short uh, uh, training on water safety. It's fairly simple. If you were to look at that test, you could probably answer those questions uh, without going through this PowerPoint. Again, we just want to keep this on the forefront of your mind as we're getting into our warmer months and we start engaging in those swimming activities and going to open bodies of water uh, like the lakes, rivers, and, uh, and oceans. Uh, that's all that we have for water safety. Again, please make sure it's one test Per person, and that you turn that test into your Pathways Family Specialist. They'll grade it, upload it to your file, where you will get one hour of credit for completing uh, water safety. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or more importantly, your family specialist or their direct supervisor, because they have more knowledge of your circumstances, uh, the home that you live in, and, and those different types of things uh, that may be more pertinent to answering your question. Uh, but that's that's all that we have. I hope you all have a great rest of the week, a great day, a great weekend, whatever time there was that you took this, and uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you around. Thanks so much, guys.